How's everybody? All right. Thank you for coming out to this wonderful panel for the San Pedro International Film Festival. This is wonderful. Thank you for coming out here. Thank you to these fine folks on our panel today. We're going to be talking about um, the internet landscape and how uh, producers, actors, directors, um, everybody in the entertainment field have uh, basically capitalized on social media platforms, crowdsourcing, um, basically 21st century uh, of filmmaking that is uh, going on today. So my name is Joshua Stecker. I'm the moderator of the panel. I'm an entertainment journalist. I publish a local magazine out here in San Pedro. And uh, I'm gonna let these lovely folks introduce themselves to you and give a little bit of info about what they do and then we will rock and roll with some questions and answers. So let's start with uh, this lovely lady to my right. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Sherry Shaw. Do I need to hold the mic? Yeah, hold the mic. Okay, I'll hold this one. I like it better. <laughs> Um, I am a acting coach in Los Angeles, and I have five different acting classes a week, and I privately coach people for all their appointments, and I'm an on-set coach as well. Do you just want us to introduce, and then we'll talk later? Yeah. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am, hi, I am Todd Felderstein. I am uh, director and writer. Uh, my most commercial that people have heard of, I did the Spider-Man TV series, and then was offered uh, some other shows, but I decided documentaries were my life, or at least they were for that moment. <laughs> and uh, I ran off and I did a film uh, overseas in Israel, and then I came back and I'm back in scripted. So now these days I'm jumping back and forth between scripted and nonfiction. And um, that, that's the that's the. Hey guys, I'm Bonnie Gillespie. I'm an independent casting director specializing in low budget indie films and web series that hop to TV, which is super fun. Um, I'm also author of Self-Management for Actors, which is entering its fourth edition as it becomes a college and university textbook around the world, and we are crowdsourcing it because that's the new Hollywood. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kia Kiso, and I'm a producer. I have a documentary out right now, a feature documentary called Mile, Mile and Half. It just showed here yesterday, as a matter of fact, at the festival, and we crowdfunded, and we're crowdsourcing it, so we're doing complete DIY distribution with it, and I look forward to sharing our information with you. Uh, I'm Randy Crowder. <laughs> <laughs> I am an actor and a filmmaker, and uh, I'm learning about as much about crowdsourcing as you guys have been learning. <laughs> There, yeah, too much of that would be cool. <laughs> I didn't want to just stuck with this one. Um, cool. So uh, let's get started. Basically, um, the internet is here. It's to stay. It, um, it took a little bit for Hollywood to catch up to it, I think. Um, and now, right now, you're really seeing uh, what was kind of a... Uh, a very independent thing to crowdfund or crowdsource uh, material and uh, projects. It's now become mainstream. We have Zach Braff doing a feature film that he crowdsourced, Spike Lee. Um, a lot of people are doing it. Um, uh, yeah, you obviously crowdsourced a, a, a film. Let's talk a little bit about crowdfunding and crowdsourcing in general and what it means to uh, the filmmaker from a producer perspective and from a filmmaker perspective. Sure, there is a difference between crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, even though they overlap. Crowdfunding is when you reach out to a community and you ask them to donate in small chunks or in larger chunks, and you offer them a premium or a gift in exchange, and then you're using that money for your project. Um, there are a couple websites that do crowdfunding right now. The two popular ones are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And it's a lot like a PBS campaign, right? Like, give your $25 and you get a special gift. So you're giving them something in exchange for their money. And then the site takes a percentage of that. Um, but your your campaign can just sit out there in the world and nobody know, any about it, know about it unless you crowdsource, which is using social media to reach out to people to give them a message. If you're on Facebook, and in essence, you're crowdsourcing. You're telling people, in a social media way on the internet about your life, but you can use that to your advantage as a as a filmmaker uh, to get your message out about your project. And um, our documentary, Mile Mile and Half, it was a team of five other people besides myself. It's a documentary about a group of artists that hiked the John Muir Trail for 25 days, and they they captured it in their own way. So our our first our first thought is. 
how do we get this film out to the world, right? Going to Sundance and uh, having Nat Geo pick up the film is probably not uh, possible. So we need to get it out to the world ourselves. Well, we need money for that. So we did the Kickstarter campaign. We eventually raised $85,000 based on or on Kickstarter to finish the funds, get uh, uh, festival fees and, and whatever it is we needed. Now, let's talk a little bit about the funding. Um, $85,000, and you mentioned earlier prior to the panel starting, does this sound okay? Guys, yeah. we're getting a little feedback out here. Okay, just make sure. Um, $85,000 through, I believe you said 800? 814 backers. 814 backers. So Individual backers. So uh, the math of that is pretty, pretty great. People were donating a nice chunk of money to, to your project. They were. Now, how did people find your project? <laughs> well, we'll talk about crowdsourcing, but sure. you had friends and... I, they mainly found out about it through our Facebook page. Um, they also, some people were just trolling around on the face, uh, Kickstarter pages or you know on their website and they found out about it. Or through um, other referrals, other site referrals that didn't come from our, our, our website or our Facebook page. Uh, other companies that we may be aligned with or we cross-promoted other bloggers, for example, or companies that picked up on our campaign like REI. But be before I talk about that, I just want to mention one, you have to identify that you have some sort of service that you're, you're, you're selling. You identify what that is. Is it a film? Are you trying to reach out to actors or whatever? And you figure out how does that reach out? How and what I how is what I'm providing answering a, a problem for them or providing a benefit? And then I suggest you just come up with a list of who are, who are the niche audiences for your project. So for Mile, Mile and Half, we came up with a list of 40 different uh, individual groups of people. Of course, hiking community, backpacking community, people that, there's this whole like gourmet outdoor chef community, you know, shut-ins, people that are, you know, have busy careers, they can't go out on the trail, people that like documentaries, environmentalists, and so forth. We made a list, and we're like, okay, where do these people live on the internet? Where do they live? Where are they shopping? Where are they spending their time? And we found our most of our audience was in Facebook. So we, we primarily focus on that. We have now over 6,800 fans on Facebook, but on Twitter we maybe only have 700. That's just where our audience is, so that's where we focus the majority of our effort during our campaign. Mm -hmm. Well, the fascinating thing of what you just said, um, you're a producer and you're talking about uh, your campaign, but in the terms that you spoke about, you were talking like a PR person or a marketer. Unfortunately, and, you have to. And that's what and that's what the indie that's what the thing is. You have to become a marketer for your own film. You have to become you have to wear those hats. And you just literally laid out a business plan of how to uh, market your film, going through different uh, genres of, or different subcategories of people that you needed to target to get the word out. And it. I would love to be able to hand my film off and have somebody sell it and they give me a chunk of money and I can go make something else, but that's not that model anymore, thankfully, because 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have not, I would have not been able to sell this film. I would not be making money right now. So thankfully we have this opportunity, but you have to think like a business person. And this is why I, I recommend to everybody do a crowdfunding campaign because it forces you to think of these things. It forces you to think, where is my audience? Where are they? What are they looking for? How can I speak to them? Um, you, you have a question? Sure, yeah, but one, one, okay. I'm learning so much from you. Um, once you go over your list and you're finding who the people are, so how do you find them on Facebook? How do you, what do you, what do you do? Well, one thing we did and we're still doing is we identify bloggers who speak to those communities, mm -hmm. those top bloggers, and we reached out to them. We said we're having this campaign. Here we made a shareable, we made shareable content. And you make something that's easy to share, whether it's a video. We did um, we did a short Kickstarter pitch, plus we had a music video and we had pictures with text on it that was, you know, quotes from John Muir. And then we just said, we're doing this thing. Would you be interested in promoting us on your blog? And we'll give you an exclusive interview, we'll give you something. And so then or we'll give you a sign something or other, and they were willing to cross, because then we promoted them too. We began doing our cross promotions um, and just building awareness. It helps to have content that people like. You know, I see some Kickstarter campaigns and the video is rather boring. You have to have something that's rather sexy and people like. And we were lucky, the very first few days of our Kickstarter campaign, REI found our video and they said, if they can get five, if we can get 5,000 likes for this video, we'll give these people $5,000. And they said like in 24 hours. 
and we got that in six hours. But it's because we identified exactly who our audience was, provided content that they were interested in, and it was very easy to convert mm -hmm. that. So, and, and just one thing about raising money on Kickstarter, most people we found that donated a little bit eventually donated more later on. They became influencers. They not only shared information about the campaign because now they were invested in it, they wanted their friends to come on board because they wanted us to win. I think this is why PBS does this, right? They're like, you've only got 20 minutes to get five more people or you know, whatever. Um, but if you keep engaging um, in conversation with them, then they're going to come back and they're going to keep, uh, keep giving you more money. So, um, uh, what Kia's talking about is uh, uh, crowdsourcing takes work. Uh, this is, it takes an enormous amount of work. The uh, publicity behind Kickstarter and Indiegogo where make a video, put up a pitch, put it on there, people will find you, boom, you'll, not true, is not true. Um, I ran a nonprofit as well as it being a filmmaker. Um, so we did a lot of fundraising through all sorts of markets. One obviously was on Kickstarter. I think we used Indiegogo more often than not. Um, we had a huge database. The percentage of people who respond to your database, I believe, is 3%. Um, so I mean, do the math. Uh, what you want is a huge team. Uh, Kia had five people and you raised 85,000, which is great. You want a team of 25. Uh, the larger your team, the better your success rate. And what that really means is that, and the cross promotion is, is, is half the battle. And basically, you want to affiliate and align yourself with people that are gonna get, you, get the word out for you. Because if you don't, you're gonna be, and we were talking about this earlier, you're spamming your list over and over and over again. And they know it, and they look at you and they go, okay, you're one, raising money for your film, that's great, but stop. Stop. Yeah, you know, just one thing that I had said before the panel is people don't like being sold to. So we created a Facebook page that was a community that we it was a place to build a community and we provided content there. What do hikers want to know about? They want to know about the latest product. They want to know about some hikers that are lost somewhere. They want to know about oh this new trail opened up or oh go out and clean the trail today. So for every three posts we put up there, one was selling our product or asking for a call to action. Hey, will you vote for us on this? Or will you, you know, do something for us or don't forget about this. But other stuff was just building content. So we we didn't turn people off. People would come to our site again and again and like our posts because we spoke to them authentically. I wanted to say the planning before you launch a campaign needs to take about six weeks to two months. A lot of people say, okay, I know I want to end my crowdsourcing campaign, my crowdfunding campaign by this date, so the money drops by this date, so I can have it to finish the whatever. And they're not thinking about all the weeks that need to go into the planning, to the research of these communities that everybody's talking about, to vetting the database, to finding who are the loudmouths in your world. Because the people who are of most value to me are not the ones who donate 100 bucks. They're the ones who tell 100 friends every day. And because they go out and spread the word. And they have just as much fun as if they're recommending a great restaurant or a great book or a movie they're excited about seeing that's already out talking about this thing that they can be a part of and that their friends can be a part of. And researching who those people are before you launch is incredibly important. And also creating a team of zones. Who's gonna cover what kind of work? Who's gonna answer comments? Who's gonna deal with spam that comes at the campaign and the comment threads? Who's gonna deal with um, FAQ type things and coming up with what we can add to the question database and the answer database? Who's gonna come up with uh, managing addresses? And if we didn't get the additional $10 for overseas shipping and now we're gonna be out that money or we have to go back and ask them to add that money to the donation. These are all administrative things that creatives don't like to think about, but that you gotta think about if you're gonna attempt crowdfunding. <laughs> I'm right in the thick of it. <laughs> well, uh, Randy, we were talking earlier before we, <laughs> before we came up and about um, having to market a film uh, on the festival circuit um, when you can't be there. Right. Right. How, is, uh, how has the internet helped you? Uh, well, yeah, I think it's been great. I mean, it, it's the cheapest way to go, actually, and uh, you can touch the most people with it because uh, once you put it out, you know, it's like a multi-level marketing, you know. I mean, 
pass it out to your friends, they pass it out to theirs, 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 you know. But there is that point like they're talking about where it's overkill. You've got to get collaborate each time you post, otherwise people see the same poster or the same blurb and they're like, ah, this guy again. Yeah. And you're like, come on, man, give me a break. I got another festival. Yeah, but okay, who cares? We're moving on. But no, it really helped a lot to generate audiences for festivals that, you know, I just couldn't get to. And uh, fortunately, you know, we had some people that had fan bases that would travel to come and see, see the film because it was in an area close to them. So uh, I think the uh, crowdsourcing is great. Uh, the crowdfunding, I'm a little leery of because it's too damn much work. Listen to these guys. <laughs> Man, you're killing yourself. You really do need a team that is that dedicated and it's hard enough just to do the film, but when you've got to do the selling before the film, oh my God, I, I can't imagine. But uh, I'm, I'm glad it's out there and I'm glad I have friends that are making it work. But don't go into it thinking, hey, all I got to do is put this up on Indiegogo and I'm going to be making my movie. No, you're, you're spending a lot of time and energy on it. They were just telling me before how much time, and it's, 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 it's impressive. And what Randy talks about, what you don't want to do is you don't want to gear up a film, put it on Indiegogo, and fail. You do not want to fail, because then you're labeled as, oh, yeah, your film failed. Not good. <laughs> it is not good. I did a film last year called Last Statement. Last Statement is a film that is based on a short play, and it was about capital punishment. So the web and our fun and crowdsourcing was great because it's a hot topic. And we actually contacted people all over the world who were involved or have a point of view about uh, capital punishment. And, um, and that generated our fan base. So that's where it was very, very successful. Um, crowdfunding we did okay. People were more interested in, and again, it was based on our team. It wasn't really based on the topic because everybody was, oh, sure, we want to show it, we'll talk about it, we'll blah, 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 blah. But, um, but you need that team, you really need the team. I, I just want to mention, this is to, to hop off the, the you don't want to fail thing, because I totally agree. For us, it's also data mining. We're, we're publishing a book, and it's a 10-year-old book going into its fourth edition. We've done it the traditional way the whole run. This time out, maybe we're at the age of no more printed books. Maybe we're at the age where everyone reads it as an ebook and puts it on a gadget. We don't want to learn the hard way that having printed, you know, tens of thousands of copies of a physical book aren't going to sell. We would like to find that out by having folks say, yes, I'm in for 25 bucks and I want my perk to be a physical copy of the book shipped to me, or no, I'm in for 10 bucks and I'll take the ebook, thank you. Because then that way, even if we fail the campaign, we only print the number of books that we need. And I kind of think this is the new publishing model. Um, you know, it's the Tim Ferriss, sort of a Louis C.K. take on the whole thing. And so for us, it was also just a question of, do we actually need to print the hardware in the way that we used to? I know that's not the same consideration for filmmakers, but that's something to keep in mind, because you can crowdfund anything at this point. It's true. And, and what's happening is that you're giving perks with all of your fundraising. So what you have to factor in is how much of those perks going to cost you. Oh my so, so what you're talking about with your digital download, digital downloads don't cost anything. So digital downloads are great. So when we did Last Statement, it was okay. When the film comes out, you're going to get a digital download, a free digital download of the film. Doesn't, there's no shipping. There's no printing of the DVD. There's no nothing. It's a digital download. So you may go out and be able to raise hundred thousand dollars but say ten thousand dollars isn't paying off your perks so not great what um we've talked about uh kickstarter a little bit indiegogo um let's talk about the other platforms that are available obviously facebook twitter are huge that's where the crowds are if you will but from a filmmaker's perspective perspective um what else besides indiegogo or kickstarter are there or is there anything else available to do Besides doing it yourself. Your great aunt, Sherry. She <laughs> you're talking about for funding or you're talking for about funding. for sourcing? For, uh, for, for funding, first of all, and then we could go into your sourcing. I, I know that Slated does some funding, but on a much larger scale, and you have to be vetted to even go into their site in the first place to be a member. Um, you know, 
you might want to talk a little bit more about the Jobs Act. Uh, you know, but it, the Jobs Act is just another way for anybody to do. Um, it, it's recently something that was signed by Obama, and it's, it's it's going into act soon. You could put on your website that you want to go ahead and start crowdfunding. You don't have to go through Indiegogo or Kickstarter. Um, however. People still need to be vetted. It's just in not in a, such a secure, like SEC way that you know people are, are are investors. So things are opening up to where you don't have to do those avenues. But this is brand new, like as of last month. Talk about the new yeah. So so the the Jobs Act is um, so basically Obama signed a new act that in the middle of September. Previously, when you do when you would do crowdfunding, um, you could not give people a piece of your project. So I couldn't say, okay, for $10,000, you're gonna get a certain percentage. So you're now a profit participant in the project. That was illegal. Now that has changed. So in the middle of September, this became legal. And um, Indiegogo has it, but Kickstarters does not, and Slate it also has it. There are a number of other new websites, new crowdsourcing sites that I'm not that familiar with, but I know they're out there. Uh, Go for it. Yeah, some are designed for musicians, some are designed for authors, some are designed for filmmakers, some are designed for entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of new ones, a lot of new platforms. And basically what they're doing now with the Jobs Act is they're saying, okay, if you give me this, instead of getting you know, a gadget, instead of getting a pair of sunglasses, you then go and get 3% of the film, or you get 5% of the film, and so forth. I don't know about the paperwork, I don't know about the SEC filing, I don't know all that's involved with that but it's a nice option. So now suddenly people can say, oh, I think your story is great. I, I want to invest in it, as opposed to just giving away my money. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's veer off uh, the filmmaking side for a little bit and go on to the talent side of things. Let's talk about actors. Let's talk about um, you know, the people in front of the camera and how this new Hollywood has changed, um, not only with casting directors, it's changed dramatically, from the black and white headshot now to the uh, uh, to the profile pages on backstage and all that, um, talk a little bit about how actors have had to adjust uh, to the new Hollywood. You work with actors every day. How does? Um, I think it's changed a lot since, especially 9/11, and I think it's changed in the way that actors way back before 9/11, they could actually get on these sound stages where casting directors' offices were and there was no problem and you could really, there was a more one-on-one -on -one connection. Randy on that, right? There was more of a connection. And what's happened now, because there's so much security and everything, it's been literally taken away, right? So there's less communication physically, but there's more communication through the internet. There's less phone calls, it's mostly emails, right? There's more what actors do, make reels, and they submit through that as well. Um, I also find, well, my business has changed in the way that I do a lot of Skyping. So I'm coaching somebody in Russia and I'm taking uh, an actress through a film in London, right? But it's all through Skype. So it's, it's crazy the amount of people that you can touch in the world through the internet, right? And what I do on Facebook for my actors, and I help self-promote them when they book jobs, and a lot of them are constantly working, I will post their picture on my Facebook page share it with them and then they share it with everybody else so it becomes a self-promotion basically for my business because I've coached them they book the job and for them letting the world know that they're working actors so it's very helpful in that capacity way different than raising money for you know for films and stuff but it's very helpful has the uh, the loss of that personal connection um, affected adversely what you're what you've been doing or is it just is it just something that everybody's had to come to terms with yeah I think for me personally, I was an actress years ago, one-on-one -on -one communication was always more special to me and I connected more like that. I think people are just adjusting. I think they're just saying, okay, we've got to get a Facebook, we've got to you know, Twitter about all the things that we're doing. We have to look at other people's you know, work online and they're making the best of it. Well, also you have to consider how it's expanded the talent pool too. But before they would have time to see open 500 envelopes and see a handful of people. Now they can sit in front of the computer and see audition after audition after audition from thousands of actors, if they're willing to. A lot of them won't, but, but yeah, the talent pool is huge can now. Can I, can I speak to that? If they're willing to. Right now, I work with low-budget indie filmmakers, so I work with a lot of people who are hungry to sit and watch reel after reel after reel after reel, and God bless them, um, because they are happy to do it, and I love it. 
Um, one of the things that I found fascinating was the last feature film I cast last month, we just wrapped, they're shooting right now, the wrapped casting last month, they uh, were open to seeing self-taped auditions for pre-reads and then only bring actors to callbacks based on those self-taped auditions. I invited 520 something actors to self-tape and by the end of the weekend, that notice went out on Friday, by the end of that weekend, 11 had come in. So it's advantage actor who's willing to do the self-tape, but so many people do feel, no, I want to get in the room. Get me in the room because that's where I shine. I'm like, but you don't get invited into the room sometimes unless you're willing to do that self-tape and you kind of have to find a way to shine self-taped today. So it's advantage actor who's willing to do it. But a lot of people are like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make the change. That's okay. There are still projects where you don't have to. But the up and coming ones with the newer, younger filmmakers, they are excited to watch people pre-audition, basically. Can I say something to that? Because I think the pre-taping is an awesome thing on a lot of levels. Because when you go into the room as an actor, you have to get it right the first time. If you go on self-tape, you get somebody to put you on tape that's going to do it 25 times till you get it right. So you have edited and made your project perfect to get submitted to that person, and you actually have a better chance. What's wrong, Randy? Absolutely. Get it right. See, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes with a lot of other things. You could be given the most brilliant audition and not get the part. So, well, you feel better now, Randy. <laughs> and as a producer, I like the idea of casting in my pajamas. Right. You know, well, like a half hour before I make breakfast, and then in between a couple calls and whatever, and I don't have to find the space. And and sometimes I just want to see the actor and how they look on screen. You know? Yeah. I've interviewed a, a number of producers, and the convenience seems to be the running theme with a lot of, with the, especially the talent pool right now, that watching the reels of you know in your pajamas and being able to do it multiple times. But having, but the technology now has allowed us, actor, you know, actors, whatever, to um, it's so easy now to do it. it it's not you have not to buy a VHS camera, spend eight hundred dollars, and yeah, you do it on your iPhone now. Yeah, also remember that Hollywood has expanded. So the, this used to be the talent pool just here. I have, a, I have a very good friend of mine who is a TV and film actor who has been doing this for a long time, lives in North Carolina. Lives in North Carolina, raises his family in North Carolina, doesn't want to deal with Hollywood whatsoever. He records everything and he sends it in and consequently he works all the time. So um, that was just a choice, you know, totally a choice. I'm moving. <laughs> I, I, I think casting directors and producers are more available and open to on-tape auditions. I think they actually like it better. I think it's a positive. Yeah, but I kind of miss a personal part. I mean, you used to, Too bad. to really know. <laughs> you used to get to really know people, uh, yeah. but now, not so much anymore. You know, you walk in, hey, how you doing? It's great seeing you. I love your work. Get the hell out of here. Thank you very much. But yeah, before you really had relationships, but uh, so th that's the only downside for me. But the upside is more people are getting a shot, and you can do it from someplace else. You don't have to live in that, uh, L.A. So there you have it. And then there's always scene work. I'm sorry. What was that? <laughs> oh, scene work. Well, we we run a workshop for actors we had for 30 years. So uh, she wanted me to bring that up. And a lot of we met Sherry there. Yeah. Five or six years ago, right, Jimmy? Back in the 80s. <laughs> Long time ago. Right? But that's the way, one way to be one-on-one. -on -one but I have to tell you, it was very different to me no, dealing with the actors I dealt with, and she runs a wonderful workshop, and, and they invite casting directors in, and actors get to do prepared scenes for them and have an opportunity to be seen when their agents can't seem to get them you know, to be seen for a particular show that they're right for. And it's a wonderful thing. However, back in the day, it was a lot cheaper, and it seemed, yeah. it seemed more intimate. Although I haven't done them in years because I coach now, but you it's still good. Ours. You haven't been to ours. Okay, Jeanette O'Connor. <laughs> in a long time. Um, let's talk about a little. Let's move into the, the sourcing. I guess we could talk about a little, a little bit more about that. Um, as we mentioned before, you know, if you don't have a Facebook page, the old joke is now you probably don't exist. So, you know, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, um, you have uh, other methods, you know, now uh, like Pinterest, Instagram, Vine. Um, you know, I, uh, a great uh, producer, Brian Koppelman, um, who's 21 and whatnot, he started doing these uh, six second Vines on uh, screenwriting, you know, and they're wonderful. And uh, he just shoots himself and gives one sentence on uh, about screenwriting tools, you know, what, what you do and what you don't. And it's very popular now. Um, 
But how are these tools influencing your guys' work now? Because it seems nowadays a new social media, a new social network is appearing every two weeks. And, uh, but people's attention spans seem to be dwindling as well. So how is that helping or hurting you guys in the midst of trying to produce your work? Young, pe young people are awesome. Uh, what I mean by that is um, everything that you're describing right now is a generation that's behind me. Um, and I'm only 22. Uh, yeah, that's good. So, but the, the generation of a teenager through the mid-20s, this is, they're growing up with this. So pretty much any business person, um, be it in whatever sector, when they're hiring social media, they don't want someone who's in their 30s or their 40s. They're going, okay, we're someone who's just got out, gotten out of college because they know this. They are so clued in. They love it. Me, I can't stand it. Right. It's, just, it's just too much. I, I like to speak on the, the issue of branding with this because for me, it, it really is an issue of brand management. I'm done. I'm full. I don't have a Facebook page anymore. I will not Instagram. I'm done. I did Flickr. Why are you going to make me do Instagram? You know, like, so I, I get that. But what I also get is brand management. And brand Bonnie Gillespie is 100% within my control if I'm first to the party, which means I don't pin. I'm not Pinterested in any of it, but I went and grabbed Bonnie Gillespie on the site because I don't want anybody else brand managing my brand. So that's where people who are coming up today, whether you're a filmmaker, a writer, an actor, or a hyphenate, and you do all of it, you have to squat your brand. Because even if you don't plan on using whatever the next shiny thing is, as soon as you hear it exists, go grab your name before somebody else does. That's incredibly important, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you're producing a, uh, trying to crowdsource a book, so it's a little different than you know, film, or is it different? How is it, um, how is the uh, challenge for you in producing, trying to produce this book, rather than say a film or any other project? Well, it's the pros, on the pros side, there's, it's got a history. You know, Self-Management for Actors is in its third edition, second printing, and it's a college textbook all over the place. Tom Cruise put it on his list of must-reads for beginning actors. I mean, there's, there's no question it's got legs, as they like to say. So we're not pointing at a concept and going, don't you think this would be a good film? We're pointing at a tried and true, best of list, every year it's out there, book that's been around for 10 years, taking it to its new edition. So that's on the pros side. On the con side comes the, we are shifting as printed matter goes. The reason we didn't do it, our traditional method, this time was because if I go to the bank and say, I'd like to buy an SUV, they'll hand me $45,000. If I say, I'd like to print a book, they go, that's hilarious, and they won't even give me 10,000. You know, and even though it's got the track record, because publishing is changing, there's the downside to it. Um, what I like about it is guaranteed perks because everybody who donates at the $25 level gets a copy of the physical book, which is less than it's gonna be on Amazon. So we figure right there, we're built in with perks no matter what happens. Um, and the reason we're with Indiegogo and not with somewhere like Kickstarter where it's all or nothing is because all we need is to know we've got enough to print a certain number of books. Would we love to print the top number? You bet, but if the audience is not there for it, we, we're okay with that. And I think it's all about being okay with change and being okay with what the audience is telling you it values. Because the audience's tastes change and if we don't pay attention to their taste changing and we just keep saying, no, this is what I create, this is what I create, then we're the dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Todd, uh, you work with the inner city, you, you work with a nonprofit with inner city kids. And so you're seeing firsthand the generation behind you as you describe. Um, adapting to this uh, new media landscape that we're in. 20 years from now, who knows what film is gonna be like. Um, 20 years ago, in the early 90s, nobody could have predicted that you know, we'd be in the digital age and, and all that stuff. So um, how, how do you see the film landscape changing in front of our eyes with, with what's going on with the social media net networks and like Vine and YouTube, right. the YouTube generation, if you will? Uh, when you start going into more challenged communities, um, computers tend to be a little bit more of a precious commodity, but phones are. So everybody has a phone. Um, computers, not necessarily. Internet service, not necessarily, depending on the community. Surprisingly, even here in LA. 
Um, I mean, I've been, I remember traveling in the Middle East making a documentary and you would see people who, who, who had no pockets, but yet they would pull out a phone. So it was really quite amazing. Um, it was just an amazing thing. But, uh, but kids today understand the technology. Um, they love shooting. I mean, the program that we just did for the San Pedro Film Festival um, was all about how to understand your phone, how to go and actually shoot media with your phone. How to go and what are, what's the technological possibilities that you can do with your phone? A lot of people look at it, they understand, oh, it's so many megapixels, but what does it do? What's an autofocus? What's auto, whatever, composition, so forth, storytelling. So the nonprofit that I've been working with is called the Story Project, and that organization, our mission was to teach storytelling, uh, help students, youth, find their voice, regardless of the community that you're growing up with. So a lot of the students gravitate towards nonfiction storytelling. They're very eager. I take that back. They have a wall. Once you break down that wall, then they're very eager to tell their own story, which is amazing. Things you cannot make up. And um, they have the tools. You know, if they have a cell phone, they have the tools. Um, editing software for me, editing has always been the hardest thing to teach, but it's getting so simple because the manufacturers of these these various programs are creating these, these, pro these programs that don't need all the bells and whistles. They just need basic cuts, basic transitions, and they're creating templates. And everybody else is, has, they already have the content. So once they put the content in, it just, you know, it's amazing. It's quite amazing. The, the fascinating model with what's going on in today's landscape is that you can watch a movie on various applications and various forms of distribution. And for the filmmaker, it's great because you're able, you're able to get your, your product out there into all forms of, of uh, channels that you really couldn't get before during the, the normal, the traditional, if you will, you know, uh, model. From a Kickstarter perspective, from the self-distribution perspective, how important is like TV on demand, um, YouTube, all the distribution channels that are now out there for independent film projects, um, do you take those into consideration when you're crowdfunding your, uh, your projects? Well, we used Vimeo first before we even started our Kickstarter campaign. We made sure that we had a music video up there using footage from the film, then we put up a trailer, and then we put up our pitch video onto Vimeo. And what's great about Vimeo or YouTube uh, is that there's a 100% chance of distribution. Like, you're gonna get it out to the world. Who's gonna see it? That's up to you, but th there are, much bigger opportunities. Um, when, when they originally started this project, because I came in later, I'm not on the hike, if you watch the movie, I'm not there, I was in Australia. You know, I came on the back end and, you know, at first the idea was like, let's get into Sundance, let's get onto TV and let's move on to the next project. I'm like, I don't think that's gonna happen. Let's look into other avenues. What are our uh, avenues that are available? And um, what was great is during our Kickstarter campaign, because we were creating this buzz, people started contacting us, companies that I really admired and liked, that were doing video on demand, that were uh, interested in distributing us internationally, and they came to us and they said, we like your content, it fits in our model, let's start talking, so we started negotiations then. At that point, we're just like, we just want a blanket, we want to get it out in every way that we can, because it's location, location, right? Like. If, whether it's crowdsourcing or it's distribution, if my project or my campaign, my film is not where other people are shopping, then they're not gonna see it. It's harder to, it's harder to go find it out. You'll watch a video on Facebook that you could half care about, but you're not gonna go to iTunes and search for something, so sometimes it's just convenience. So you wanna be wherever you can. And because of our campaign, and because we were building this community, and it was a great film, it's easy for me to sell it. So a festival would come to me and kind of be like, mm, maybe we'll get you in, or distribution companies like, oh, I would li like to know a little bit more about you. I could say, I have 6,000 fans. Here's my trailer. Here are all the perks, and I can give you, and if you need help with marketing, I have a poster, I have a press kit, I have a lookbook, I have all of these things, and it was very easy to sell it. And we are just about blanking it everywhere we could, everywhere we could go. And, um, Another thing too that I want to mention that I think is really great about what's going on right now is there's this, now the market's really open, it's much bigger now, there's a glut of content out there, 
But what's beautiful about that is that you can now have niche. These niches are being built, and people are making millions of dollars out of making niche projects. There's this guy that makes movies about firefighters for firefighters, and he makes like one a year. And I didn't totally research it, so if you look it up, I, you know, the story might be slightly different. But he makes <laughs> like a million dollars per project, and all he does is he just goes and he shows the films in the different communities to his firefighters, and he's making tons of money. Universal would have never picked that up because they would have been like, what would the billboard look like and whatever. Like if you wanted to make a project about dog lovers that like dark chocolate, like there's a possibility you can create that world. And if you like it, guaranteed somebody else out there likes it too. So there are bigger opportunities. One of the things about that though, and this is kind of, maybe you guys can expand on the, the flip side of that though, because there is so many opportunities for filmmakers and people in general to produce content. You can shoot a movie on your iPhone, you can publish it on YouTube, you can uh, tweet it out, you can, you can market it on Facebook, you can do all these things with it. But the bottom line at the end of the day is it has to be good. You know, content is still king. You know, the, the script has to be good. The filmmakers have to be good. The actors have to be good. But there is this now, uh, People are saying that the generation that, that's out there thinks everybody can be a star. You have these TV shows, American Idol, The Voice, all these people trying to get that, that piece of fame, um, which causes a huge glut in the market because you have people who think they could be a filmmaker. But the beauty of it is, though, um, the cream still rises to the top when you have a good project. So um, we talk about all of these uh, wonderful avenues of getting the project prepared, but at the end of the day, it still has to be good. And, uh, you still have to be a good filmmaker, you still have to have a right, good script, you still have to be a good actor or actress. Um, can anybody expand on that a little bit uh, about what they're seeing right now and if it's, or are we heading to this weird market where we're gonna see a lot of crap? I just have to say, we do see a lot of crap. And I think that it's, it's about, like they're talking about really marketing yourself and really pushing forward and really doing your best job to get there, but some people just have more luck. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of reality shows on right now that take a lot of work away from actors they're that are, actors. that what? Sorry, they're all actors on the shows. <laughs> well, uh, if you call them actors, but um, <laughs> um, they, you know, it's, it's, it's just taken a lot of work away, in my opinion, but a lot of those shows that are on aren't the best content, and they're not very good, and they're boring, and it's, it's, it's just how they put all the pieces together, how they got there, that's my, that's my personal opinion. So I think you have to work your hardest, try your best, believe in yourself, have the best, you know, your best work at hand, and then, you know, and then see what happens. I think I look at it from the, the perspective of it's taken away the barrier that used to exist, where people said if they would just give me a shot, they would see how talented I am. Well, there's your shot. Go on YouTube, take your iPhone camera, there's your shot. Build your fan base. The excuse of they won't give me my shot is over. And I think that's awesome. Uh, I was just going to say, um, at the end of the day, it's also business. So with um, regards to your question, uh, as far as the democratization of filmmaking, yes, there's going to be a lot of content out there. But it's a business. So people are doing it for fun and for a hobby. Sooner or later, they're going to get bored. They're not going to make money. You have to pay the bills. They're going to do something else. The people who are making money, unfortunately, money does not equal fantastic programming or fantastic content. Uh, and that is the business of what we do. Uh, but you're going to have certain programming that is effective and it's going to generate an income. And you're going to have certain hobbyists who have one hit or maybe two, but that's going to be it. Then they're going to move on to other things. So there's going to be a lot of content out of there, but, but this, the people who do it seriously are, are going to stick. And yes, the cream will rise to the top. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody want to, uh, I'm going to go down and play, uh, who's that guy? Monty Hall. <laughs> I'm sorry, you had to. What's your name and where you're from? Uh, from New Jersey. Right. Uh, Debbie's from New Jersey. What exit? That was the thing. <laughs> um, my question is, um, we ran a, uh, or someone ran a Kickstarter campaign for us back in March for a fundraiser. 
and they were going to you know, raise $10,000 and bring all this money, and then at the end of the 27 days or however many days that they had for the campaign, we had about $1,008 in pledges, and then we ended up with zero. So I want to know if Kickstarter and Indiegogo, if you have so many days to raise the money, and if you don't raise your goal, do you not get anything at all? Do you not get whatever's pledged? I mean, that, that's what I've understood. If I understand correctly. So, yeah, Indiegogo, you get whatever you raise. If you choose that. If you choose that, you, you have to decide when you're creating your campaign, what are you going to do? If you, okay. if you get your money, if you, if you reach your goal, it's a lower percentage fee that Indiegogo takes from you. If you don't reach your goal, it's a higher percentage, but you still get to keep some of the funds. Okay. So in Kickstarter is only you have to reach your goal or nothing. And okay, when so you budget, and when you budget, make sure one, you budget for how much your premiums are going to cost you to create. Like ours was over $7,000 to create our premium, so we had to pad. And then they also pad for your percentage. I know some people don't pad, and then they're not able to do the thing that they needed to do to budget it. But like Bonnie said earlier too, you really have to plan it several months in advance. And there's a great uh, blog on Indiegogo called Insights. And in there, a statistician has gone through all the winning campaigns and broken it down into numbers. And, and he's basically laying it out to you. Um, and you'd have to look for new numbers, but he says, like, every three days you have to post a video. Every person that donates, you have to, within 24 hours, thank them. Um, you have to reach a, a third of your budget third of your goal within the first quarter of your campaign to reach your goal. And so we went through the blog and we took a calendar, just like a production calendar, and we are like, okay, we need to have a video every three days and we're gonna have a 60 day campaign. We need 20 videos. We better produce those ahead of time because once you're in your campaign, you don't have time. Okay, we, and we did, we did giveaways. So we would do little, you know, whoever, you know, little contests or whatever, and we would give away a flask or a bandana or something, and we would do videos, and then we did exclusive content videos to backers, so it'd say, if you're a backer, you're gonna get something special tomorrow, but if you're not, you're gonna miss out, and so people are gonna scramble. We would give gifts to people that upped their pledges, and we would do both updates that were graphic and texts, and we put a whole calendar together, and we made sure we hit every single one of those statistician goals, and we actually earn more money than we expected to. You have to consider it just like it's pre-production for a project. I just saw a statistic 87% of all campaigns fail. And, and, and like 80 of those, they didn't plan anything. They just thought it was like buckshot, just like shoot it and hopefully something happens. Yeah, that's what the, the friend that tried to help us, I mean, she didn't realize, it's like, oh, I can do this and yada yada, and then she probably just got it going and then that was the end of it. And, and so we learned the hard way. Like you said, it is a full-time job and you need a team. You really need to be on it and plan it. So thank you. Great yeah, he is, he is spot on. And the other thing is, is that besides the Indiegogo, um, YouTube, which I love, I type any question into YouTube, you know, how do you open water? And there's a guy, he's probably 12, who said, <laughs> and, um, but, he's a millionaire. and he's a millionaire, exactly. But if you have a question about fundraising, about crowdsourcing, about crowdfunding, and you go into YouTube, there's going to be a dozen, or many dozen uh, people who will tell you their successes and their failures. The other thing that I did that we didn't talk about is I called people, literally, with a telephone. I found people who had successful campaigns. I called them and I said, what did you do for a successful campaign? And um, if you can get them on the phone, they're very willing to talk to you about it. And Me. just keep in mind that the celebrities that do this are a whole different league of what yes. we're all talking about up here. It's easy for Spike Lee to say, hey, I'm gonna grab fund my next movie. People all donate to it, but for us, a little different ball game. I have one more if you don't mind. Uh, you mentioned uh, giving like a, a percentage to the people that donate uh, to your project, but obviously you don't want to give a percentage of your of your film or your project to somebody that donates five dollars. So, what is you know what is the minimum or how much do people have to donate before you start promising them or something like that? That's you know. I'm sure there's a legal ramification which I don't know, but what you do want to do is you create you create your own tiers. So you would say. Um, I don't know, let's say you're doing a movie for half a million dollars. So for a hundred bucks, you probably, you may or may not give something, or you may give, like, 
In other words, you don't want to sell 300% of your film. I think that was, I think that was a movie. Um, but you may give, for $100, you may give like a quarter of a percent. So, uh, or, or even less than that. But I would, yeah, but I would say, if you're gonna start giving away points on your movie, you're really talking about $10,000, or $20,000, or $50,000. You're not talking about 100 bucks. 100 bucks, you get a pen. Perks pricing yes. is really important. We spent weeks doing perks pricing, and we categorized what costs us nothing, what costs us shipping, what costs us stock plus shipping, what costs us time, and what is that valued at, what costs my assistant time, which means I'm paying her to do something for somebody. We categorized everything, and then priced our perks so that we weren't going to start hemorrhaging money if people bought the most uh, lucrative perk, the most beneficial to them. So you just have to do all the ballparking of the money and make sure that you've analyzed if we we're wildly successful at this tier, did we screw ourselves because so many people chose it? And then you cap it and you say, this one, there's only five of this because at the end of five, I don't want to give away any more points or whatever. And you just have to make that part of your pre-production calendar. That's also, um, that's also an incentive. So if you're giving away 30% of your movie, you can say, I'm giving away 30% of my movie. The first, ex yeah, exactly. You're gonna, this is what you're gonna get. The rest is going somewhere else. Yeah, question over here. I have a question on how much to give your investors. You have to start at the back, what you need. Start at what you need. Okay, say you need $600,000. Then you're gonna know how much your shares are going to be worth so you don't end up selling 300,000 shares and you have no money to pay anybody and then you get into trouble. Um, so you say, okay, I need $600,000. Okay, so now I need six people to donate $100,000. And for that, they're going to get one sixth percent. Or you can divide it up separately through, say, you divide it in half and your producer, director, whatever gets the left half and the other 50% is divided into your into the people who invest for you. But in order to give an investment that's going to be legal and set up, you have got to do an LLC. You've got to become, they have to become part of your LLC also so that they are now owners of that film instead of just giving nebulous money out there. You have to account to Uncle Sam down the line where'd you get that money, what'd you do with it, and what did you promise them coming in? Because we're, we're in the thick of producing a film right now. And this is what, this is, you have to start it where you need to go backwards and divide it up so that you're not giving stuff away. And when these things first started, I mean, people were probably just doing $5, $10, $20. That's different. Yeah, that's, yeah, so. Those are perks. Those right. are perks that you take right. in right. account of what you're giving away. Build it up front. So you, you know, the other it. thing that you could do, in, in, um, and this was true in nonprofits, but I'm sure, <laughs> Possibly, if you can find a pass through, is that uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo both have a nonprofit category to where they don't take any money, um, and it's so there's no they they do it under the kindness of their heart. So you can affiliate yourselves with a nonprofit. I know that when we fundraise as a nonprofit, um, you know we I don't remember Indiegogo, I don't remember their policy, but it's either zero or it's much smaller, it's, or it's it's drastically reduced. So there's certain nonprofit benefits to fundraising. Um, I have a question about the perks. Um, is it really necessary to do like the cap and the t-shirt and all that? And if so, are they really successful? You have to identify what your audience likes. You know, our audience are hikers. They like bandanas. They like flasks. You know, uh, is somebody else's, you know, if you have the dog loving chocolate lovers, then maybe you, you know, you're doing chocolate or something. You know, it's whatever your audience likes. So that's part of your niche audience research. But there are, there's a lot of um, information out there as far as like what perks are the best sellers and make sure you have like a $25, $30 one, you know, a sweet spot of like a $5 one. So that's, it's research based on what's best for your film. Yeah, that's part of that pre-production period. I was out asking every one of my 12,000 some Twitter followers, what do y'all want? If I have a magic wand and could do something for you, what would it be? And then we came up with the Let Bonnie Do It perk, which is for the price of $500, I will do that actor thing that you never wanted to do, write your bio, design your website, 
reformat your resume, cut your demo reel, let Bonnie do it. Because actors are like, I don't want to do that thing. And I'm like, great, that's 500 bucks. <laughs> but, be, but I asked them. I went and asked them. I said, I've got people who are already a fan of the work that I do. Let me ask them what they want. And I knew I didn't want to get into the merch business because then I got to pay someone on my team to deal with quality control and returns. And what if the printing didn't work? And what if the graphic was off center on the color and people, you know, sent them back? And then we're in the refund business. And I just I didn't want to deal with that mess at all. But I just took to social networking and asked the people who say they like what I do, what do you like most about what I do? How can I help you? Which goes back to knowing your niche. Can I add one thing? Um, something that we didn't really talk about is that generosity begets generosity. And um, what I mean by that is that when you're doing crowdfunding, donate to other people's campaigns. It's very, very important. There are a lot of campaigns out there, donate five bucks. I think the number is seven. So you donate seven dollars to other people's campaigns. They become your friend because you have funded their campaign. So suddenly when you have your project, who do you reach out to? The people that you've donated to, they will then reach out to others. That is your network. So be generous. Don't just count on, I can't really look at this table and go, oh, we're all now best friends, and then hit them up for money tomorrow. I'm gonna, well, maybe I can. Um, <laughs> yes, um, $7, exactly. But you have to be generous. Your network is created through your own, by spreading your wealth. And one more thing about perks is a lot of the perks that we chose, like t-shirts or flasks or whatever, were a minimum purchase, uh, a minimum order from the manufacturer. So even though we were maybe doing a, giving away a hundred of something for Kickstarter, we had 900 more. So it, immediately we had a store. And then we put that on our website. And then we started doing packaging. And then now we have our DVDs and Blu-rays available and we're packaging them together. Oh, pretty soon I'm gonna have a holiday package. So you're gonna wanna give my film and t-shirt and something to somebody that likes it. We're now in fulfillment fun. Um, you know, where we're having to get together at the office every week and put together packaging and, and, you know, I would love to outsource that. But I'm creating value, right? So then when I go to people, I go to festivals or I go to distributors and I say, look at, I'm, I'm legitimate. I have this store, I have these trailers and what everything. It's just, and it's one more people to, in, it's one more way for people to engage and to enjoy the project. And now we're on hiking trails, we see people with our t-shirts and stuff. So it's, it's, it's cool to see. It's like, he's busy from it all. Uh, one more thing about perks too. I was interviewing a couple of podcasters yesterday and one of the things, very popular, they have a big audience, but one of the things they talked about as regards to Kickstarter was, if at all possible, avoid anything with a size that goes in with perks because at the end of the day you can end up with you know a ton of small shirts or a ton of XL or whatever but um, yeah and one more thing about perks is because now we had all this stuff to sell um, right after we were done with the film we did our premiere at the dances with film festival we went we traveled around the country with the film showing it at events quite often we would four wall a theater um, in our hometowns or near, we had a fiscal sponsor, the American Hiking Society, so we took it out to DC as we were creating awareness. And because we had done a Kickstarter campaign a year ago, people were hungry for the film. Hungry, when are you coming, when are you coming? So of course, we'd go out there. We paid for our travel by selling DVDs and Blu-rays and T-shirts. That's how we paid for it. Um, and we, we didn't sell any of the DVDs or the Blu-rays online. They were only exclusive if you came to an event. We just started selling them uh, and we released in June, so we just started selling them online now. So it was a great way for us to then turn a perk into more money. Yes? You at the LA Podcast Festival? I was, was that? Yeah, I was there yeah. too. It was a pretty cool day. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. I live in Santa Monica. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I, I recently moved to Los Angeles from New York City. Uh, where I've done a lot of theater. Um, and I always kind of dumbly, well, I don't know, made my decisions based on like what I wanted to do creatively. Um, so, you know, I've done Ibsen, Chekhov, <laughs> all these things, but then I got older. And I was like, well, I'm not making money in the theater, right? Uh, so, I have family in Los Angeles, and my brother was like, well, come out here. I had an agent in New York, and I was going out for 
like a lot of television shows. Um, but my brother was like, come here, you get out of front of your like, waiting tables job. I was like waiting tables like 40, 50 hours a week while doing theater, you know? Um, and it was exhausting. And then I came out here because I could just do the hustle and live with family. Anyway, I'll get to my question. I suck at these panel things. I should never go. And I should never raise my hand. But, um, but, but I guess the point is what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, I, I, now I'm, you know, I'm going out for all this television stuff. But, and I don't want to sound pretentious here. But it's like a lot of schlocky stuff. And it's like, how many times do you need to see the story of like, honey, the Howards are going out. Why come we never go out? You know what I'm saying? And, and I. Let me just interject, because you're coming from theater, OK? Right. So theater has texture in the words. Theater has depth. Theater has that glorious, you know, you can automatically connect to the, the layering of that character because there's so much more depth in it. Television is more linear, right? But there's more money in television, so obviously that's why you came out to Los Angeles. So you can't complain about the words. What you have to do as the actor is really create the underlying life of that character to make those words just work for you and just throw those words away. So you're, you know, take your characters that you worked on in the theater in the past and apply it. And but so you feel like you're doing it. A lot of the like content of the writing is not Correct. so compelling. Correct. But if you listen to, if you, once you get the job, the money is compelling. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I struggle with that. Let me throw in my two cents is that what you have to recognize is that there's the business of TV. And the business of TV is there's X amount of people that work in television. Same writers, same directors, same executives. This is what they create. They have people that pull audiences and they say, okay, you know, what do audiences want? And they want X, they want Y, they want Z. It's like, okay, well, let's go to these writers because they do X, let's go to these writers, they do Y, let's go to these and they do Z. And then they have this thing called the upfronts and they try to sell them. And, um, and they see what sells and then based on what sells, they go and they create more content. Same writers, it's a very, not closed system, but it's a very difficult system to break into because, it, because it's, somebody explained it best this way. You know, Omaha, Nebraska is a big insurance town. You know, somebody doesn't just go to Omaha and say, I'm gonna go and work in insurance. You know, they have to learn the business. They have to understand it. It might be a little bit easier. It's the same here with TV. You know, you're in Hollywood. You have to learn the business. You have to learn what's going on. You may not like the content. You may not, but this is what people are buying. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, somebody creates something different and it changes the world. And everybody goes, wow, that's amazing, so everybody tries to copy it. But then they go, hey, let's go back to the true blue. And the true blue it has a specific cost, it has a specific cast, has a specific audience, they're guaranteed, has a specific rhythm, they don't have to worry about it. They know that their bills are gonna get paid and they're gonna make money. TV is a very consistent job, they wanna keep it that way. The, the good news is you book a one-line co-star on a top 10 network television show today, you're paid for years with residuals for having done that job so that you have the freedom to do the theater that feeds your soul. So what I like to say is, if you're not crazy about TV, get down with it anyway, because then you can wipe your tears with $100 bills. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? So just consider either falling in love with it, finding a way, finding a compelling reason, and if it's because it enables you to do your theater career that you are so passionate about but that doesn't pay and that isn't valued in LA, sorry, it is a really good reason to get behind doing what may feel schlocky because it empowers you to do the stuff that feeds your soul. Okay. But if you're gonna walk in and judge the material and go, oh, this is dread, that's gonna read in the room and you're not gonna be cast and you won't know why, because your talent's good. Uh -huh. But we're going, he doesn't wanna be here. And we want happy people on the set with other happy people. There's already one miserable person on the set and he's a suit, and so he gets to be, you know? <laughs> well, I got a second part of my question, if you'll allow me. So I've talked to people you know, other actor friends of mine, and they're like, well, why don't we all create our own work? Ooh. So, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, I've always felt drawn to, I'm from the South, and to creating stories of like r rural people's struggles and what rural people deal with, because I don't think that there's a lot of that on television. Um, you know how the, I don't know how The Wire dealt with how there's sort of this invisible, do you remember that show, The Wire? How there's like this invisible people that are kind of in, in, they're invisible because they're in poverty. Nobody really gives a shit about those people, right? Excuse my French. 
So I, I was thinking. I just really want to say though that everybody who worked on that show had come from ten other shows before it, before they got the privilege to tell a story that otherwise wasn't being told on television. I'm not judging you know? those. I'm not judging those people. I'm just saying that these are the stories that I'd like to tell because that's where I come from. But it's, it's hard to enter the game groundbreaking. Okay. One of the things I say is you get you get in and then you change the system from inside. But if you're coming at it from the outside trying to change it, the people who are in the circle of writing for television get a little protective. And they're like, your, your script's not gonna get looked at. And so when you create your own content, if you say, but for a niche audience, we're not trying to go to TV, we're gonna go on YouTube for a little while and see if we can build up a fan base. Eventually, yes, you can get there. But you get there by showing you're bankable in the medium that you're trying to play. Okay, thanks. Google. And, and I saw your, your your movie on um, Sticks blog. Have you ever heard of Sticks blog? It's a hiking blog. And he bought two copies, one to also give away for a contest. And just, I saw the trailer, it looks really cool. And I can't wait to see it. And I entered a contest to win it, so I hope, wish me luck. <laughs> Google. Sorry for taking up so much. Yeah, here's my suggestion. First of all, Google UA, United Artists, because that was United Artists back in the day. It was founded by a bunch of actors who wanted to control and make their own content. And the second thing is, is that you're talking, your question deals exactly what this panel is about, and it's about the web. And if you want to go out and create original content, it doesn't have to be a half an hour. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be five minutes. And there are a lot of people who are going out and they're making original content, they're putting it on the web. And there are ICM, William Morris, you know, WME, CAA, they have a team in their offices. Their job is to scour YouTube, scour video, scour video for new talent. Um, let me just say one thing. I had a client a couple years ago who was having a hard time getting jobs. And then she got into this web series. It wasn't paying. Back when web series, they pay now, but they weren't paying way back. And stars ended up picking it up. And then when they were casting this role for, um, what's the show? Uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Uh, uh, the lead guy, he, he unfortunately died uh, in Australia or New Zealand. Oh, uh, Come on. Uh, the, the, the Sam, the, the Spartacus, Come on. The, the what? Spartacus, Spartacus, thank you. Yeah. Alzheimer's. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so Stars picked up the web series. They were looking for this role, and they went, what about that girl that's on that web series? She had one day to put herself on tape and booked a series regular. So there's no harm, no foul. You should just, like they're saying here, you gotta prepare it, you gotta write it, you gotta structure it, you gotta know how to sell it, and then you gotta do it. Same thing. Right, bottom line, amigo, there's never been a time where it's been cheaper to grab a camera, edit it at home on your, on your computer, and slap it right up on the web. This is the greatest time of opportunity for unknown artists there's ever been as far as cinema is concerned. So just get on it and do it, brother. But don't be negative. You've got to be really positive. And just reach out to that Last niche question. audience. If you're out there and you like that content, there are other people that do too. You could be like the fireman, right? The fireman filmmaker. New York better TV now. Last question. I have a question. You said that, like, um, on your site, like every two, three days, you would post a new video, and so over the arc of your campaign, you decided on twenty. What kind? I mean, granted, your your show is a project is a hiking show, so I'm assuming that some of it was about hiking, but it wasn't like one day it's how to hike or if you're caught out in bad weather, hike and. You know what I mean? Different kind of topically things like that because that's a lot of videos without, per se, not giving away the film. Sure, right, that's true. And just to be clear, we posted the videos through Kickstarter, so people had to keep coming back to Kickstarter to see the content. We would also put them on Facebook too sometimes. You know, exclusive content would go directly to the backers' email addresses. Um, so, for example, we did, and we also did blogs regularly too. So they would be, um, you know, and we had two editors of, as part of our team, so it was easier to create content, very smart of us. So, um, you know, there was one that was like a, a side story that you don't get to see much of in the film, and it was a little, uh, little comedy bit or a music video or even a video of just the team getting together thanking everybody, thanking all the backers or, um, you know, they could be informal. You know, here we did shots of like, here we are packing up something to go to you, or 
Um, the content could always be varied. Some of the blogs were, what is it like to hike with your spouse? Or how do you deal with altitude sickness? You know, so some of it was how to, and some of it was just you know fun content. You know, some of it was easy to produce, and some of it took more time too. What was the length of the video? We never went over three minutes, except like right around the three minute range, if I remember correctly, except for our pitch video, the one that's the that you you're on the landing page. Mm -hmm. That was longer. I think that was maybe eight. And go to it. You might enjoy it. I like the way they did it. It was just the group of filmmakers around a table talking about what are we going to do with the money, why do we need it, and then launched into a trailer of the movie, and that's what that's what got people involved. So many of these Kickstarter campaigns, you can't get a sense of what what their art is like because they're just here in front of a camera. Uh, please donate for me. I get bored immediately, and then how do I know my money's actually going to go to a valuable person? So you got to show your work. Indiegogo and Kickstarter both have a category that says winning videos, so or winning pitches. So you can go onto those pages and look at the other people's campaigns and look at their videos and see what they did in order to go and have such successful campaigns. There are a couple that are really, really brilliant. Um, some really bring in, to bring in production value, others don't, and they're just very clever. But see what differentiates one that wins and one that struggles. Well, we're right about out of time, so does anybody have any final words that they want to say, or if not, uh, anybody have anything else? Did we miss anything? Nope? I want to thank these guys. I learned so much from you guys today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Well, you know, Sherry and I want to do a movie, but we need you guys <laughs> so we can do it. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. We really appreciate it.